Yeah, maybe my mic's hot. Oh, awesome hair. Amazing panel. Uh, love being in India, but holy shit, you are a country of ish, right? This conference was meant to start about nine ish. Now it's about 10 ish. It'll finish about 11 ish. Who the hell knows? But I can tell you that I'm going to hang out with you tonight for drinks. I'm going to bounce、uh, a little bit after I speak.、Uh, but I've got about half an hour with you. And in that half an hour, I really want to sort of cover a whole swath of topics. There's a couple of things of quick observations. Beyond India being an ish country, there are two other observations for you. One, I mean, your, dra- your traffic is absolutely no joke, right? It's a phenomenal experience to understand that people just kind of make their way here. And the pace at which you go, there are zero accidents, I notice. But the thing that's also interesting is that you really do love the shit out of your ringtones. I mean, you guys are, non- you are non-vibration country. And not only that, you don't mind taking calls in the presence of others when it's super quiet. It is a bizarre experience for me. So it's great coming to India because I'm learning a lot of shit here today. Well, I also think that computers are absolutely useless. They only give us answers. Now, you'll be surprised to know whose quote that is. It's not mine, it's Pablo Picasso. But I think it's a phenomenal, phenomenal quote because as the panel talked about earlier, and whoever has asked that question, you know, there's no data without creativity, no creativity without data. I absolutely agree with that. But here's the deal, man. I think that these are all the things that you probably have talked about in the last, I don't know, 24 hours or 16 years. These are the sort of things that people corner me at now at parties, on planes, in restaurants. They want to know all about this shit. The one thing, you know, whether it's AR, VR, MR, they want to talk about feelability, vulnerability, viewability, playability. They want to know about all of that stuff. The one thing, and the reason I got into our industry is this thing, dude. What happened to fun? Fun, I think, left our industry about three years ago. Because at some point, we went from a trusted environment in this digital hemisphere to a place that's super anxious, man. When I fire up my phone in the morning, there are two things I see misery and sports, both of which I'm not very good at, by the way. But whatever, dude, you'd expect me being an Australian to like cricket, but maybe not. So I used to work for this company. Quick background this was the company I used to work for. We sent out more CDs than people on the planet, dude. I was not with the company when we did that, so that's not me. But we actually merged with Yahoo and created a new company. I thought it was going to be this. I designed, drunkenly designed this brand on a plane. <laughs> we didn't. We decided to call the company Oath, and we're proud to be one of the sponsors here today. But here's the deal about Oath there are only two things that I care about, and it's culture and code. And the thing in the middle is creativity, and that's really what I'm going to blast you on right now creativity. But you can't get there unless you focus on culture and code. You have to do both of them. Because if you only do one and not the other, you end up with this shit. So, this is culture.、Uh, this is a Sony Walkman. Who had one of these as a kid? Okay? You're too young for this shit, young lady? You don't, this, is a, this is a Walkman. <laughs> you can Yahoo search this shit later for me, man.、Uh, so, what's amazing, you're the only person in the room that, you know, but what's amazing about this, who still uses it? Yeah, nobody. Oh, hey, you got the back. The 75 year old dude. I get you, man. I feel you, brother. But here's the deal. <laughs> yeah, he's going to punch me later. That's awesome. <laughs> this is what's amazing about this. Imagine having a brand called Walkman and getting your ass kicked by something called iPod because when they enter digital, way too late. But if you go too far the other way, look, and I, we're partners with Google. I think they're amazing, but not everything they do is incredible because this is the worst product on the planet. There is nobody on planet Earth who has friends that still has this product on their face because if you don't want to have lunch all by yourself, walk around the town with these bad boys on. I promise you. Delhi will be yours. But this is what happens when you index too far on code. But if you balance with both, I think you can end up with the harmony of creativity. Now, we're in this industry. I mean, I, I think what's fascinating about this is we're talking about post advertising. We're in an industry that uses buzzwords. We're also in the industry, the only industry where you talk about、uh, users. We shouldn't talk users, we should talk humans. Because there's only two industries that talk about users, right? Drug dealers and software manufacturers. It's unbelievable. But where I find it to be incredible is that the most abused word I believe in our industry today is what? This thing disruption. I can't tell you how many times a day I hear this thing. We need to disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. I'm like, awesome. How do you want to do that? Like, let's use technology. I'm like, oh my God, it's the business model that sucks. We need to think about the business model being the disruption, and technology is one of the adherers that allows it to do it. But in 2018, the word I'm hearing every other day is experience. What's your brand experience, 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 experience? And if you were here for the last panel, that's what they really talked about. s a m a z e their entire 45 minute presentation was experience. So, what's amazing for me is that when we think about that, 
You can either target humans like this. This is psychographic targeting according to Harvard University. This is strivers, believers, actualizers, achievers, makers, blah, blah. That's one way you can target humans. You could also target humans this way. The Maslow rule of hierarchy. This was theorized in the 40s. I think this is incredible. The only thing missing from this chart that needs to be updated is high-speed internet at the bottom. <laughs> Otherwise, we're good, man. And by the way, for you, data is cheap here. It's amazing in India. If you understand that behavior is changing our need, that's the power of it, is that behaviors are changing because of technology. Now, that also means that there are certain things that technology cannot do for us. Why? Because we're humans. Thank God it's deeply in the DNA of our bodies. And it means that these sort of things can never replace. You can never be replaced sometimes. There are some times where it never can actually be replaced. I'm going to take you back to that. That is too good. This might be the only good image I have today. How good is that? The idea of, you know, there is no technology that can replace human touch. <laughs> you scumbags. But what I do know is that if you understand human need, that's half the job of fulfilling it. So behaviors are changing, but understanding the human need is how we actually think about creativity today. And then immediately people say, well, let's talk about the connected human. The connected human is not necessarily this person. I don't know whether this is the sort of human you want to hang out with. <laughs> There's probably a couple of those out there in the booths. I don't know. But that is you know, not necessarily where Spaceship Earth is headed. I think it's headed in a slightly different space. But however, you know, again, this is, I think, the topic of 2016. 2016, 2017, everybody talked about VR. I don't know if we've had a topic about it at this, at this particular uh, session, but everyone does talk about it. And everyone has probably tried it on, true? Who here has tried on VR? OK, a lot of us. Who here owns a pair of VR goggles of some kind? So can I ask you what brand they are? What are they? Samsung. Samsung Gear. The Oculus ones. Did you buy them, or were they given to you? You bought them. When was the last time you put them on your face? A week ago. And how long was it on? And how long was it on your face for? About half an hour. About half an hour. That is an unusual person, because this is what normally happens. You know, this is what happens globally, guys. This is the same shit that happens. I say, hey man, who's tried VR? Woo! All the hands go up. Who owns the goggles? Woo! No hands. Or they get them free. Comes with a phone. Not here in India. You don't get free phones. What okay. Is it? Kind of what is it? VR goggles. Shit. That thing, sister. You never tried those on? That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> If you go out there, you're going to try some on this afternoon if you want to. And you can also walk around with a Walkman sometime too to figure out what that shit is. But here's what's amazing. We bought a company that builds VR content. We're, we're into it, man. But it's amazing how many people haven't adopted it yet. So maybe the VR moment has passed. But the other moment that we're in is a slightly different moment. But by the way, when you do wear VR goggles, you don't give a shit who's around you. I much rather watch people with the goggles on than the content that's in it. But I can tell you that if it does take off, that storytelling will be different. Now, as I said, because you're unusual, most people have the goggles on their face for only a couple of minutes at a time, and rarely do they have them on. So today, and the reason for that is it's still linear story. You know, if you go to a film and I sit with you and you laugh and I cry at a scene, nothing can change. It's a linear story as told by a director. But when you put those goggles on, the world is going to deliver you content in different ways. So if it knows that you're crying and I'm laughing, it will pivot and potentially provide you with different types of experiences. That's the promise of VR, but we're miles away from being there. But where are we today? We're at a place where AR is powerful. So those of you who Snapchat, what we call AR, augmented reality, is simply filters. A 2D layer on a 3D atmosphere. I love when brands and marketers use it to actually do things like this, the ability to try on makeup. It's frictionless to be able to actually have these experiences. We didn't talk about that on that panel earlier, but they're the sort of things that it's used for. And if you don't believe it's going to be a thing, you have to go to China. So the Asians are building products that are dedicated for children that actually bring the digital and physical experiences together in a blended experience. So it's not your phone, it's not a tablet, it's actually designed to bring augmented reality into the reality. It's pretty amazing, man. However, sometimes reality is even cooler than that. Check it. This is the Jaguar F-Type simulator. It's just sitting on a six-axis hydraulic platform here. Roll you around, lift up, down. <laughs> How rough are we getting back? <laughs> Once you're wearing this helmet, that's really going to simulate exactly what it's going to be like on the track. Very good. Cool. Make sure you brace yourself. Good luck. OK, Glenn, I'm about to start the ride. 
Welcome to Jaguar Virtual Simulator. A full sensory experience. Combine with the So keep hold of the grab handles. Are you ready to experience the power of Jaguar F-Type? right then you know what happens next she shits herself but here's what's amazing sometimes and let's not forget this a lot of you represent physical brands I hear Reeboks in the house it's a physical brand so your physical brand experience is way better than digital experiences sometimes and then of course we go IOT it's a big category for places like India if we think about it though it's not Internet of Things of which there is considered to be 34 billion different devices connected by 25 that's a lot of different devices that are connected, but it's really about the internet of emotions. These products that are collecting data on us, look at this. This is a product that you clip to your pillow and it monitors your sleep pattern. So we can distinguish the difference between a dog barking and a car alarm going off so we can do something about the data. Or this, it's called Pacify. It's a smart pacifier that will monitor a number of times a child sucks on the pacifier will tell you when it's teething. Or this, coming out of, this is coming out of the Nordics. These little buttons you click on, it does multiple actions. Open your garage doors, turn on your Spotify playlist, play, turn down your lights. Whatever you choose to program, those little tiny buttons that cost $30 is available to you today. And then you've got voice control. So you've got the ability to have these types of pod experiences where we go back to activation by voice. And if you watch kids that are like 10 years old, when they have cell phones, they speak to it. This is a category that's really going to take off. But then you've got something like this. So if you're on this packaging environment, if I take a look at this bottle, the only thing that's on this bottle that's smart, oh, actually, it's got a QR code. Who knew? But if it could have had a barcode on it as well, that's the only thing that's kind of smart on this. But this is an example of an RFID chippable temporary tattoo. So for two weeks on your skin, you can do by pressing this sort of thing what you normally need a screen and a keyboard to do. So this is, gives you a sense of where potentially the future of packaging is going for packaging to be smarter than it is today. Because for there to be smart packaging means that the devices that speak to that packaging don't have to be so futuristic, which is kind of a cool thing. What about wearables? Now, wearables is a category that's still kind of wanting to see whether it takes off. I think you'd agree with that. Uh, has anybody got a wearable on right now? Can I ask what you have? What do you got there? What do you got there? It's a Gokia. Uh, it's a Chinese one, right? No, it's not. It's not some cheap-ass Chinese thing. It's awesome. Uh, it's Indian. Awesome. What do you got, brother? Apple Watch or some shit like that? Rich kid? Samsung. What do you got, bro? Apple Watch? Apple Watch? We've got some fanboys in the house. I'm loving that. Who's got one at home? They don't have one now. Yay! Look at the hands. They all go up. Why don't you have it? You didn't think I was going to pick on you, did you? You're like, oh, God, why did I put my hand up? This guy's asking me a question. I don't understand what the f he's saying. Do, why are you not wearing it? You don't feel the need. Okay, that's unusual. Here's the deal. Uh, most people say, well, it ran out of battery. Uh, it does the same thing my cell phone does. I socialize the fact I walk 10,000 steps. No one gives a shit about that. So why use it? So if you think about it, though, they're amazing products. These little supercomputers that are on your wrist are doing things that your phone can do. But where I find it to be amazing is that today it's about packaging. Some of them look like they're feminine. Some of them look like they're masculine. Some look like they're from the future. Some look like they're from the past. They're all different shapes and sizes, basically doing the same thing your phone does. And that's why we're bored of it. Because to adopt a new habit, you have to be prepared to break one. But here's an example of something that I think is pretty amazing. This is coming out by Samsung Lab. It's not available yet, but it is unusual. So for the Samsung dude in the back, this is for you. This is an example of a new watch they're coming out, that when you take a call or listen to messages, you hold your ear. So it creates a conductive listening technology from your wrist to your finger. It's using some sound wave and creating waves off your jawbone. It's probably going to give you cancer. <laughs> but you can figure that shit out another time, dude. But here's what's also interesting. This is another wearable that's a bit different. This wearable will shock you if you do something you said you're not going to do. So you go and have three beers today and you said you're not going to want to do that shit, this thing will just shock you. So at least there are wearables that are different in this category. But there's 290 of them. And the number one category is fitness. But what we're finding is they're all over our bodies. They're not just on our face and our wrists. They're actually even on our cats and dogs and in the fabrics of our products and even in this sort of thing. Have you ever noticed that the world's most powerful men don't carry a wallet? In fact, have you ever seen them pay 
for anything. Well, now you can join them. Introducing the MJ Bale Power Suit. In collaboration with Heritage Bank and Visa Paywave, we've developed the technology to embed a contactless payment chip and antenna into the sleeve of a suit. So now you can pay invisibly Amazing, wherever right? you go. So when you guys demonetized, it could have been like that. And when you think about it, what Haptech is, Haptech is designed to create a visceral experience. Check this out. And is that far up there? Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's it. Oh, Check this out. Yeah. 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 If a player is tackled, then you get to feel the physical effect of that. But if a player is nervous before a kick, then you get the fluttering, you get that kind of sensory experience. The physical experience of a player. So those of you who love sports, you can sit in your basement and no longer have to go to Disney World to experience 5D. You can sit on your ass and have it move around you. It's pretty amazing. And this is brought to you by a media company, not a tech company. Pretty amazing. And then you have food companies like Mondelez. I know Nestle was here, but their competitor is Trident Chewing Gum. They believe that when you chew chewing gum, you can focus. So these guys got together with a Japanese clothing designer and said, when you put the devices into the pockets, it blocks out all of your updates. You get nothing, no network, no updates. It becomes a dumb device. So you can focus on the human interactions in front of you. But I would argue the creepiest thing I've seen for a long time in the wearable space is this thing. This is called the gaze. This is a 3D dress that will morph and change based on your biometric. So if you want to attract or distract that person in front of you, the dress will grow accordingly. How crazy is that? I need that shit in New York, man. It's crazy. So everything today has built-in intelligence. We can now target people when, where, what, why, and how. But the truth is, if we go away from these other screens that we've had and we end up with different screens that's more about the wearable web, it's going to be an incredible revolution for us creatively. And we're going to be able to invent new ways to engage with humans again. Because look, guys, you started out in cinema. I know I need to update this slide. God, nobody likes Kevin anymore. Um, we started out in cinema, then we ended up with television. And then we ended up with a smartphone. And then you ended up maybe have to market on that, so good luck. So where I find it to be fascinating is that you're probably asking yourself, so what? All of this shit, what does it mean? Well, it means that we're still in the business of sight, sound, and motion. To do what? Create emotion. Why? 75% of purchase decisions today are sold to the heart. Then we justify those decisions to the head. And that's the beautiful opportunity today. Now, I'm from Australia, as you guys can probably tell. Times are simple for me. I'm from a country town, little house, 10 people, though. Chinese Catholics, man, we are unstoppable. That is 12 people, two-bedroom house. So I've got some therapy to talk about, too, man. But here's the deal. At 17 was when I bought my first car. So I'm of the generation that when you buy a car, you have freedom, independence, and self-expression. Today, though, kids are born connected, aren't they? You hear this all the time. 37% of children under the age of two can operate the swiping device better than the parent. When you give them analog, so when Reebok's thinking about print, they think that shit's broken, dude. Right? Kids. But here's, <laughs> here's the deal. If you have a marketing degree, you were taught the four Ps. The four Ps were invented in 1948. Awesome. I think that shit is old school. I think it needs to be updated to this. Platforms, pedigree, partnerships, and performance. It's more about the quality of a relationship B2B than it is consumer, because consumers' behaviors are changing. We've already said that. So let's talk about that. Here's the deal. It no longer do consumers just consume the content you produce. You have to worry about the creator, the critic, and the curator of the experience, the slash gen. These little bastards that believe they're this, don't they? Artists, bloggers, VJs, DJs, influencer, ambassador, amplifier of your brand. If you're lucky, they take it with. And they do this stuff. So you're sitting there going, oh my god, what's he showing me? So there was a young lady who was on a news feature in the in, in US, DJ Michelle, she's like 22 years old, took it and remixed this thing into this incredible, fabulous experience, because she loves to remix. And you end up with this very beautiful cultural moment. And then a lot of people say to me, hey man, can't old people still produce good content? It's not just a young person's game, right? Please tell me it's not. No, old people cannot produce good content. Here's an example why. 
This is a video from a guy called Joe Griffith. Joe went to Vegas for a week with his wife. He filmed his entire vacation on, he just forgot to turn the GoPro around. Excellent student. Know what direction the Grand Canyon is, I'm not sure. You get me? See, old people are idiots. But here's the deal. Audiences that you are amassing now have their own audiences, and that's the new power of what we're talking about. Building contagious content gets passed around quickly. But here's the challenge. Personal expression for the youth is now the new form of entertainment. This is what you're competing against. This is the second tallest building in Hong Kong, by the way. So we have more kids dying from extreme selfies than people that are dying from shark attacks. That's the world we're in, extreme selfies. But where I find this to be fascinating, that the young generation that most people want to target are not about themselves. I thought they were. They're actually more about a community of social. And it's becoming apparent to me that the open social web is not where it all happens. It's happening in closed social, interconnected personal human relationships. Who here is on WhatsApp? Yay. Who here is on WeChat? Who's online? Who's on Snap? Who's on Instagram? Whose Instagram is set to private? A ton of hands go up. The network is closing itself down. But the power of that is this, this sort of thing. This is the most anxiety-filled experience for me on the planet. I am shingy no friends. When I send out a message, I'm like, please, God, someone respond quickly. And that's those dings that I hear that you guys still love, notification language. That's a powerful thing for brands. The other thing that's powerful is understanding that the world is going closed. So in WeChat, this is an example of Dior. Dior marketed this bag in WeChat only available in WeChat, sold out 48 hours. Cost, $4,200. So people have no problem spending a vast amount of money in closed networks, not just with people, but even with brands. But what people want is they want to achieve happiness. They want to spend time with their family and friends, be true to themselves, and they want to be financially stable. So the values of young adults is actually more aligned to their grandparents than their parents' generation. They just have different platforms of expression. And that's an opportunity for you because they're busy, driven but they represent a massive spend globally and they're also the new part of the people that are in our workforce that's why every brand wants to take them seriously they also want to be entertained if you ask them the number one thing they want to do is entertainment and that goes way beyond economic boundaries and why do they want to be entertained because the vast majority of young adults today are bored tearless I'm of the generation that when the Sun came up my parents would boot me outside and say don't come in until the Sun goes down those days are dead and buried. Everyone's like, this bloody shit. And where it's amazing for me is that that's why creativity has to be redefined. Because you're no longer in the ads business, I'm told. This is no longer ad tech. This thing should be called con tech. Because you're in the content business. Okay, if you're in the content business, that means you're competing with everybody. You now compete with popular culture. Because what you're doing is not necessarily the purchase funnel. You're trying to persuade people to make decisions that are different. You're implementing change. That's the new new, and it's not through emojis. This is rubbish. You have to think about other KPIs that matter to your business, other verbs, want, purchase, desire, sympathize. The one I love most is share. So if you build content that people share, then your brand can go with, and that's powerful. So forget about it being in real-time marketing. I don't think that's important. I think you need to be relevant. Just speak to people when they want to be spoken to in the format that allows them to connect with you better and deeper than ever before. Why? because the world is overwhelming. You're hit with 1,900 media messages per day. I would argue that your TV channels, your news channels, that's 1,900 media messages per second. You get like 1,000 people on that screen and everyone's yelling at each other. That's crazy shit. Television here is nuts. But where I find it crazy is it becomes underwhelming because I can't find what I'm looking for. So what do you do? We have to think about this. The sixth largest contributor to stress today is media overload. So think about it. The stuff you're producing on behalf of the brand that you're working for is stressing people out and killing them. <laughs> Just kidding. Maybe. But here's the thing. I do believe that the only thing we should care about is attention. Why? There's 24 hours in the day. How you assign your attention to a brand is how good of a job you do at attention. And that's the power, man. 24 hours is not going to change. And we all know that this is the place. You guys have forgotten about desktop. You've gone straight to the supercomputer in your pocket. And where I find that to be amazing, it doesn't matter where I travel. Universally, we all suffer from exactly the same problem of tech neck. And where this is incredible for me is this country is a golden opportunity. 57% of a $1.3 billion audience today is mobile connected. 
That is a massive opportunity for growth. And your data plans, as they come down, your consumption behaviors go through the roof. You love content. But so many brands treat mobile like an infant, which I think is rubbish. In 1997, I could text message Coca-Cola vending machines and interact with their products. That's before smartphones. Today, experimentation has to come back to mobility. Why? Because you have stupid ads. So these ads are mobile ads. This is a website I visit in Australia. Terrible. And these are apps. We have dumb apps. I fire up my Starbucks app in... I live in New York City. I fire up Starbucks, it shows me a map of North America. Genius. This thing I paid $1.99 for, which is how long can I hold down my thumb for on my iPhone screen? Stupidity. <laughs> there are dumb apps out there. It turns out that the rest of the world thinks that apps are the only economy. You guys, 30% of your population like both, mobile web and apps. So there's an opportunity there. But people download fewer apps. I didn't know this was a thing here. You guys delete apps all the time and reinstall them. And then you delete them again, and you reinstall them. <laughs> Holy crap, amazing. People spend more time, more money on the apps they actually have. The average number of apps on people's phones globally is 40. The average number of apps people use is five. So let's think about that. Most of us will try a mobile experience once. So if it doesn't do something radically different, dead in the water. And that's a missed opportunity because you're spending all that time in that supercomputer in your pocket. So that's the opportunity you guys have in front of you. And when you fall in love with somebody on the mobile space, you become a power user. And when you become a power user, you will brag about somebody's brand and the awareness-based advertising that is the crust of our industry will actually re be reconfigured. Okay. But please keep it simple. Why? Because if you think about it, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It's a quote by Da Vinci. I love it. The chaos is happening in media. So the business of media is chaotic because CMOs have to think about, in the past, just these places. Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to read any of these, but these are some examples of where people are expected to touch points with consumers today. And guess what they want to do? Every brand wants to target every single person on the planet. Awesome, programmatic. Then they want to go deep and intimate at the same time. Oh, that's brilliant, that's native. Woohoo! that's a lot. Because if you think about it, data and creativity live together. Because without data, there's no creativity. Without creativity, no data. But where I find this to be fascinating, guys, is that if you collect data smartly, you do something amazing like what Domino's did. They said, you tweet out an emoji of a pizza, we will send you a pizza. You can only do that if you're very smart about the way you collect data today. That's the power of first-party data, yes. The second thing is, where you know where somebody's located, you also know the consciousness of their change. You know what their context might be. What are they wanting to do? And you can predict that, and that's very important as a brand. Then you can start delivering these experiences to them, and we transcended advertising. Our industry is not here yet, but I believe that's where we're headed. So look to the signals of your data, not just to the noise. Look to signals for great creative ideas, and that's where we head. And in the native space, I'm told that most people would rather read about a brand than be advertised to. So put your, places in, in, put your brand in places you can't buy media. Buy scaled media everywhere else on the planet, including at us, with Oath. But here's the deal. Here's an example of a website where you cannot buy media. So makers of Barbie's house, Mattel, decided to list Barbie's house for sale in Malibu for $25 million on a website that is visited by mum and women. That is a genius move. That is authenticity of brand. But the opportunity for you and the dirty little secret is that I believe that you, the consumer, is outpacing them, the brands. Why? Because you're doing this. And if the vast majority of what people are doing on the planet is app-driven, no ads. So we have to think about creativity differently. Now, how can you do that? You need to reflect culture. So invention matters. In the real world, we have to still invent stuff. Look at this. This is a data signal. It turns out that Chinese people and Australians like to drink beer in the shower. This is a company that's created the shower beer. There's nothing special about that, but how amazing is that? Look at this company. Oop, I've gone back one. This company has decided, Carlsberg, has decided to look in the ingredients of their, sh their beer and said, we can make a great shampoo, conditioner, and face tonic. They did a limited edition range of products sold out. So if the beer industry goes down the shitter, they could be in the cosmetic business. Mondelez, these guys who make a crazy cookie called Oreo, decided to do custom packaging. What reflection is this? This reflection is the color in book culture. They've decided, let's give them the ability for people to customize their packaging, and let's give them the ability to customize the fonts and the characters, and you end up with your own personalized set of Oreo. Pretty amazing. In your country, you did this. Everywhere else in the world, we cannot stop raving about this. This is an incredible invention. You know, soapable chalk. 
And then you did this. You retired some bloody aircraft carrier and your bike manufacturer said, we're going to give you a piece of history. You guys are inventing amazing stuff. You are on a global platform. It's phenomenal. Coca-Cola, however... Rugby. Let me go back. I want to show you this. Coca-Cola in Vietnam decided they don't want their bottles in trash. They changed the bottle tops. And now what you've got is a bottle, a bottle or a product that's totally different. You've got a water pistol, a bubble blower, a pencil sharpener. They've taken trash and made it something that sits within the living room. But check this crazy thing out. In rugby, wounds heal, cuts mend, bruises disappear. But teeth, well, teeth, they are lost forever. Salda Beer, main sponsor of the Rugby Union, presents Beer Tooth Implant, an idea to reward players who give everything they've got for their team, including their teeth. We decided to give rugby players back the teeth they had lost in battle. But we weren't just going to give them a simple tooth back. We developed a unique dental implant, a specially designed tooth to open beer. How crazy is that invention? By the way, it's real, and I'm going to save you from the surgery because I'm almost out of time. Can I just pause here for a moment? Do you guys mind if I go eight minutes over? Are you okay? Otherwise, I walk off now. We're cool? Right. Hacking. The very important component of culture is making stuff and hacking stuff because we spend a lot of time here. So analog has become visceral. So if you can think about hacking culture in your brand, maybe you can end up with something inspiring like this. In many countries, DHL has more locations, more vehicles, and more employees. That's why DHL is faster. However, to communicate this with a classic advertising campaign is expensive. So why couldn't the competitors advertise for DHL? For that purpose, giant packages were taped all over with thermoactive foil and cooled down below the freezing point. In this way, the competitors picked up a black package that transformed back at temperatures above freezing and delivered the message in the most beautiful colors. <laughs> kind of cool, right? Maybe we need to encourage brand hacking, who knows? But what I can tell you guys that's hot as we land this plane in a couple of minutes is this. Context matters. Super easy for me to say, so hard to do, but I'm sorry, that's the gig. And so to do that, if you think about it, in all these fragmented platforms where you're told you've got to plan everywhere, we've now realized that we can calm down because we know where people fuse. And the thing that anchors them the best, in my humble opinion, is still tried and true video. Everyone loves it. It's everywhere. And it's crazy that we're freaky for it globally. It's incredible how much content we're going to consume. And we don't care whether it's super short, like six seconds, or it's super long, like 10 minutes. If you can create contagious experiences that are grounded upon sight, sound, and motion, you can hold people's attention. And we're in a world of mind share equals market share. I mean, look what you can do in six seconds. Well, how good's that? We'll sit here and watch that thing 10 times, man. That's better than a 60-second TV spot. Amazing. All right. So I would argue that the most abused word in our industry is storytelling. Please, God, please stop the telling and just get on with the story. You can end up with something incredible like this. When will love be free? 
that? That's the Christmas story as told by John Lewis, one of the largest retailers in the UK. At Christmas time, that's their story. They're trying to move as much product as humanly possible off the shelves, but they're not showcasing any products. They're selling to the heart to justify to the head. And if you're open to the power of the internet, you could even end up with something as crazy as this shit. Yeah, laugh, because you guys don't live in the States. But here's the deal, man. You can, if you're open, you can also end up with something cool as this. Check this out. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you do a beautiful emotional experience that goes on for like five or six minutes by John Lewis, or you end up with UGC content like this, or you allow yourself to be spoofed. At the time when your brand is most important to somebody's mind share, your brand sentiment goes through the roof, and that's a powerful metric for us to consider. But the reason it's been an absolute pleasure to jump over to India just for a couple of days is this incredible quote coming off the back of International Women's Day. It's my all-time favorite, which is simply this. If you obey all the rules, you miss all the goddamn fun. And isn't that the reason we became creatives? Thank you very much indeed, guys. Take care. God bless. Thank you so much indeed. Thanks again. Can we have a huge round of cheer one more time for the coolest keynote ever?